appreciate it. My name is Keith Steva from Arlington, South Dakota. There seems to be an assertion that we need to increase military spending while reducing spending on climate change, economic development, Medicaid, and other investments in people such as education. And you just mentioned uh, that the unsafe world out there that we may need to increase our military spending to, to keep us safe. But I, and, and I am all for the military. My brother actually died of complications from service in Vietnam, so I have skin in the game when I say that. Other than sound bites and political positioning, what data or evidence actually suggests that we actually really do need to increase military spending? What data or information do you have that you see that says we need to trade our programs for elderly services, investments in education, technology, and manufacturing to stay economically competitive in order to increase the portion of the budget for military spending? There's a zero sum game there. How do you make that choice to increase spending for military? Thank you. And honestly, I mean, I, I think I know that uh, there are choices that have to be made and uh, priorities that have to be set anytime you go through a budgeting process. And I see a number of folks who are involved in local government here who, who deal with these issues every day as well. Um, what I would tell you is uh, that if we don't get national security right, the rest is conversation. I mean, if we can't protect the country, then all these other things that we are talking about really aren't going to amount to much. And so protecting the country is job number one. That's what uh, that's the fundamental responsibility of the government. Um, now, when you say, is it a zero-sum game, and, and, and how, do you, how do you plan on doing this without hitting other areas of the budget, uh, there are, as you know, when you look at the budget, think of it as a big pie, uh, sections of that pie. The, what we spend on defense is about a sixth of that pie. Uh, about four-sixths or two-thirds of it is what we call uh, mandatory spending, entitlement spending, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, things like that. And then uh, about the last six is what we call domestic non-defense discretionary spending. And that's the part of the budget that we've kind of been continuing to squeeze uh, over the past few years. I don't think ultimately you fix the budget process unless you deal with the two-thirds, the four-sixths of the budget, which is getting bigger and bigger all the time. I think you have to look at ways that we can reform and make our entitlement programs work more efficiently. I don't think those programs are, currently they're not sustainable in their current form. And so we, we've got to figure out ways to, to get more out of those. Um, and then the other thing I would say is the way that I think you deal with the need for um, you know, additional spending in the military is, is, is what I talked about earlier. You grow the pie. You make the pie bigger. And when you have economic growth that's running in that historic average of three to three and a half percent, you have a lot more money coming into the re into the government as well. In fact, they say for each additional increase, one percentage point increase in GDP, in the rate of growth in the economy, it generates about three hundred billion dollars a year of additional tax revenue. So over a decade, that's three trillion dollars. And if we're at one and a half percent today. Um, in, in the economy, and we get the growth rate back up to 3.5%, that's two points uh, of additional growth, or about $6 trillion in additional revenue in the economy. So part of the, part of the solution to all this is, yes, we've got to do better you know, when it comes to how we manage our, our, our spending and the budget. Um, we're going to have to deal with the, uh, the unsustainable uh, rate at which entitlement programs are growing. Um, we're going to have to make harder choices than even in some of the non-defense discretionary spending parts of the budget, but we've got to get higher growth in the economy. Higher growth solves a lot of problems, and you know, when you're growing at 1.5% uh, um, annually, it's, uh, it's awfully hard to see a way out of the kind of the, just the sort of swirl that we're in right now. And um, so I would argue greater growth, uh, more disciplined uh, to the degree that we can, find say, additional savings in our non-defense discretionary part of the budget. But then we've got to tackle those things that are creating the real uh, long-term challenge for the country fiscally, and that's the mandatory part of the budget, or what we call entitlement programs. Follow. Yep. Yep. Thank you. The, the, the one point, it, very, very good answer. I follow all of that. I think it would make sense. The one piece that I really didn't address was the, how do you measure how much you need to spend on the military? We already acquire and spend uh, like what, six or seven other countries total for military. 
when is enough enough? And I'm not saying it is or isn't, but how do you know? What, what's the measure? Well, I, I think the answer to that is, I mean, there's some historical norms that you can go by, but, you know, we have, for example, the smallest Navy that we've had since literally the beginning of World War II. Um, and, and our Air Force is getting down to, you know, since the inception of the Air Force uh, about that time, too. Um, and, and then I would think, too, when you, you listen a lot to the, the, the commanders, they'll come in and they'll testify in front of the various committees and basically say, okay, we ask questions. Can we fight a two-front war? What if something happens in the Pacific? What if we've got something we have to respond to in the Middle East? And, and they will tell you, based on the assets that we have available to us, the weapon systems that we can deliver, uh, whether or not they think we can do that. And there is growing concern among the military leadership about our ability to respond to, uh, you know, two threats at the same time. Um, the other thing I would say is there are a lot of metrics that get used probably that, um, for example, there's always been this theory that in the U.S. we ought to spend about 4% of GDP on the military. And right now we're down, I want to say, three-ish, high twos, maybe three-ish. Um, one thing we can do, which will contribute to this as well, is to get other countries to raise theirs. And I, I was just in a um, meeting with some of our European allies about six weeks ago. We were in Britain, uh, France, and, and Germany. And basically the message there was, okay, the requirement for being a NATO member is that you spend 2% of your GDP on defense. There are only 24 out of the 28 NATO nations, or I see only 4 out of the 28 NATO nations that are doing that today. So we need them to step up their commitment um, and help share that burden, particularly when it comes to the alliance that we have that defends uh, the West in our, in our interest. And so that's also a message we've tried to deliver. Um, and we were very clear about that when we were meeting with these countries, that you've got to do, you've got to raise it. And they all agreed, uh, we'll do a better job. But uh, when you ask for metrics, that's one metric that's typically used. Does it relate to our ability to deliver firepower? You know, I, I don't know, but there's always been this belief that we ought to we ought to have about four percent. We're well below that now, but I think the more um, important metric is what our commanders tell us we can do in terms of responding to threats around the world.